he makes that's the fundamental question. I mean, I thought it was very interesting when you were talking about how to find a, a tempo, the, mm -hmm. the sort of things you might be looking for, um, the, the events, the different number of harmonic events per bar. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you think that's, that's very true for mu all music of this period? Is that, is that something, I mean, you've got a huge experience, obviously, of playing music. I think it's true for music of any period, mm. even if you're looking at Schoenberg, when you're, when you're looking at that time when his music is becoming atonal, mm. um, that, you know, you can see that. I mean, there's a, in Verklärte Nacht, there's a beautiful 6, 4, 5, 3 cadence there that comes back. It's in bar 41, <laughs> in fact. Um, and it comes back at key points, and he uses that cadential formula that, that his audience understands to sort of highlight the structure of the poem in the piece. Um, it's the same in Mahler, it's the same in Brahms, this relationship between harmony. I mean, as long as the music is tonal and not minimalist, mm. then this approach of how many chords per bar are there and what's the kind of dynamic flow between those chords, that's gonna, that's gonna pay huge dividends in terms of inquiry into how it might go. Once it's totally atonal, if there is such a thing, um, then, then maybe that starts to become too complicated to work out. Yes. Or if it's like nip, 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 kind of, you know, if it's like a minimalist thing where, where self-consciously that um, dynamic energy has been taken out of the music, then... Yes, I mean, I would, I would contend that in minimalism it just happens slower. It, right. it just happens over a very long period, so you're, uh -huh. you're looking at the same kind of harmonic uh -huh. events, but yeah. you're looking over an hour or something. Yeah. Well, I'll, I, I need, would contend. I need to go back and, and, <laughs> and re-listen re to Music for 18, yes. Yeah. Um, I just also, I mean, I don't want to keep you here too long, but one, one thing that also struck me um, was that you were asking them to go away and look for, for instance, recitative, look at, look at tropes, mm -hmm. the, the, the thing with a capital T. Yeah you know, go, go back into a recit and find a question. Mm. Is there a, a four or five chord there? Yeah. Um, how, would you, how would you equip this group of students to actually go and, go and do this research? Because this is, this is requiring a broad knowledge, isn't it? Of you even mentioning Mozart opera. Mm -hmm. um, what well, advice do you have for them? Be curious. So, so rather than thinking, I've been to the music shop, I've bought my Bach cello suites book, I take it home, put it on my stand, and I start practicing it. Um, you know, where does that music exist? In what's it for? Who's it for? Um, what does it do? How does it work? I think those are good questions to ask. How does it sit in relation to the rest of his output, that whole library wall of incredible music? Mm -hmm. um, how do, um, I mean, a very good example is the C major prelude yes. that we tend to hear in Casals's, you know, groundbreaking performance, mm -hmm. which is which is done in quite a steady at quite a steady speed. But actually, one of the manuscripts has presto over it, and then you think, ah, oh. and you, you look at you hear that next to the D minor well tempered book two which is the same idea. No pianist would play that. Yes. In that, it's the same musical idea. Mm. Um, so it's, it's kind of contextualizing as much as possible and being curious about how it might work. And I really mean this thing about, about reading to children, playing to children, that if you, you know, it's a, it's a high pressure situation that mm. if they start getting bored and throwing things around you know it's mm. you know it, it could be chaos then that you need to keep them all drawn into what you're doing mm. um doing that then at Wigmore hall or king's place becomes a much much more a stronger possibility mm. then mm. so these are quite challenging um tasks that and, and so i would say that you're suggesting they should play in as much bark as possible yeah. as continuo players mm. playing in Brandenburg, playing in cantatas. Mm. I mean, did you develop your understanding of the suites as you went through and played all, all the cantatas? 
Well, I didn't play all of them, but really I, awesome. I, was, I spent most of that year kind of ab absorbed in, in that mm. world. And of course, playing the passions as well is something that, um, that's an extraordinary privilege to, mm. to be involved doing that. Um, but, but again, not just Bach's music, he, you know, Handel's music, um, seeing, how, seeing the influence of Bach on people like Mendelssohn. Mm. Um, it's, it's listening in a curious way where you, where you think, oh, that's a cool progression. You know, Schubert C major quintet. It's the same chord progression as page one of the Bach Suites. So we, we, you know, that kind of tells us something about how that music can work, I think. The, the contextualizing thing, um, it, I was in the Eroica Quartet for many years and we were told by one concert promoter, oh, we've, we've discovered that you're not really a full-time quartet. Is this true? <laughs> We're like, well, yeah, we, we play in John Elliott Gardner's orchestra and we do, you know, we've just, you know, been recording Mozart and Mendelssohn and we were playing lots of Mendelssohn quartets. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we do, we do other stuff. Um, oh, we only have full-time quartets, so we were, we were unbooked by this. <laughs> well, and I was like, well, actually, you know, what we, what we were doing as a group was, was sitting in John Elliott's orchestra, playing Beethoven symphonies, and then going and playing Beethoven quartets. That, that kind of cake slice of, of musical experience is not spending all your time playing quartet, quartets, but it's spending all your time playing that music mm. um, in the way that they were then. They were immersed, you know, Ferdinand David's quartet that, that you know, he led Mendelssohn's orchestra, he helped him write the violin concerto. He and his players would have been totally immersed in that music, mm. regardless of its genre. Yes. So I think that's a, a really key thing. I think with the Bach Suites as well, it's not just yes. about being a continuo player, it's about being absorbed in that genre and that way of thinking mm. that then translates into how you play the music. Yes, yes. And this is the last thing. It was something you said to Joe, I think, about technically, technically you can do this. Mm -hmm. And I know that perhaps some of the students came today thinking that you were going to talk very technically mm -hmm. about fingerings or ways of bowing or all sorts of things, which you didn't. I mean, you, you talked about interpretation and the, and the music. But um, you, you were saying that it's not about the technicality of it. It's that's, you have to leave that aside mm -hmm. and get back to what you're actually going to speak, how you're yeah. going to speak this. Yeah. So it's about finding the fundamental of what you're doing. And in that case, it was um, transposing it down a fifth, whereas mm -hmm. he, which he did straight away, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and immediately there was a musicality and a dance that was com just completely evident to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so then he's teaching himself. Yes. Saying, oh, so what I've got to do is make my D major version like my G major version. Yes. Or it might be taking out the levels of decoration that are there, stepping back and seeing the simpler version and f making that compelling. Um, and then introducing little bits of ornamentation that may be Bach's mm. or, or not necessarily. Um, and seeing how you can put those notes in perspective. Mm. And perspective is a really useful word yes. as well, I think. We did do some quite technical stuff. But well, no, I know subtly. you did, but not, not perhaps in the way they were expecting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so really, yes. I think technique comes from music. Mm. So, so we get the technique that we need for the music that we play if we're curious enough about how the music works. Mm. If we learn technique as a separate thing, um, you know, with scales and studies, and then we say, well, now I'm technically equipped, now I'm gonna go over here and play music. Mm. Um, that's making, it's creating a divide, kind of in, in the mind maybe, but, but certainly in the approach, it's creating a divide that, that stops, stops that natural curiosity between how the fingers work and how the music works and what the brain wants to do with the story, mm. if you like. But there are no easy answers here. I mean, I noticed that when you were talking about slurring, there was no solution that you offered there. No. And um, you were offering certain tropes and patterns. Yeah. But you were also saying it might, it might not be like that. Yeah. You have to make up your mind. Yeah. 
I mean, that's a challenge, isn't it? I think with Anna Magdalena, with the Bach cello suite particularly, because we don't have the autograph, there's a, there's a problem, which is that we can never really be absolutely sure what Bach intended. But that doesn't absolve us of the requirement to understand how the music works. And I think if we can do that and think long and hard about where these slurs begin and end um, and how that relates to how the music works, it begins to solve a lot of those jigsaw pieces in that puzzle, if mm. you like. Um, but as I was saying to one of them, if, you know, if, you, if your slurs don't delineate something different from separate notes, then do any slurs, it doesn't matter what, what bowing you do. Yes, yes. Um, Although you didn't like the paired notes. Well, I... Because it felt yeah, against it. Yeah, for me, I think the, the, what Bach's going for, and you, you find exactly that thing in the violin sonatas and partitas, where, where you see a group of three notes well, four notes where three of them are slurred. It's called a mesanza, that figure where you've got three, that kind of idea. Um, and you see Bach writing that, but he doesn't need to specify it because he knows you know it's a mesanza. He knows you identify that, mm -hmm. you know exactly what I mean. And, and Anna Magdalena either is thinking, yeah, I know it's a mesanza as well, and she's doing it even less specifically than Bach mm. is. Or, um, or she's just copying what he's written. Yes. But either way, what we're, what we're trying to see behind her layer of, of uh, seeing through to what Bach might have written, either way, our responsibility is not to say, well, I think that's two notes. No, I think this is a millimetre earlier. I think this is a millimetre later. Mm. It's about uh, what do these, this little group of notes mean? Is there a pattern? Mm. Um, not that that pattern has to be dogmatic, but I think in that particular case of that three, not two there, the pattern is quite funky. Yes. Um, and it gives you a syncopated feel against the beat. And that's, that's typical of Bach that, mm. that you see everywhere in the cantatas, in the violin, sonatas and partitas. Mm. Well, one thing I would really like to thank you for is your idea of the, the, leaping, the eight leaping dolphins <laughs> in the E-flat major, because that's one of the most challenging suites that obviously nobody offered to play actually initially mm -hmm. because that's in E flat major it's difficult it doesn't yeah. resonate in the same way and the idea of that being in three and having the leaping dolphins showing every now as yeah. they came up was was a really wonderful way of freeing that piece actually you know I think I've stolen that idea from Tortelier really <laughs> I think he was saying that years and years ago but I I, I can't remember I thank you, Paul to tell you if it, if it is your idea. But the, but the idea that you're aware of, of some of the, you, you know that all of the lines are there, but you only actually see one or two of them at any time, yes, I think is, is perfect. I'm sure that's from him. Yes. I, I should have given him a footnote. <laughs> well, anyway, I think we need to probably wrap up now. So it's just left for me to say thank you very much again. Thank you, Helen.